Before continuing to talk about uh, singularities, let's first discuss a bit complex square roots. And for starters, let's refresh our memory about the real valued square root. So you know if you have y equal to the square root of x, where x is actually a positive number, that this y value is what you get when you solve the equation x is equal to y squared and you solve that equation for y. Okay, I guess we're all familiar with that. But something we often sweep under the rug or we often forget is that when we solve this equation for y, there's actually two solutions. Not only do you have y is equal to the square root of x, so this is x and y, but we often forget that there's also a second solution, namely minus the square root of x. Obviously, if you square this thing down here, minus one squared will just give you plus one. So both of these guys are solutions to, to that, uh, that equation. Okay, so far so real valued, but let's now look into the complex plane. What happens over there? So what happens over there is that we're looking at a certain function w, which is a function of z, which is the complex valued square root. And then for some strange reason, people denote that with z to the power of one half. They don't use the square root symbol from over here, just to make a distinction between real valued square root and roots and complex valued uh, square roots. But again, just like before, this square root is what you get when you solve a certain equation. When you solve the equation z is uh, w squared, for w. So we're trying to figure out what are the w values that solve uh, that equation. The question is, in this particular case, do you also have two solutions? So pause the video and try to explicitly calculate the solutions to that equation, but now this time in the uh, complex domain. So I hope you still all remember how to take the square root of a complex number. What you need to do is you need to write that complex number in its polar form. So z is rho exponential j theta. And then you can find the solution by taking the real valued square root of the modulus, and then by taking the argument, the, the angle, and dividing that by two. And then you can easily verify if you take this number and multiply it with itself, that you get back to, to z. So this is one possible solution to that, uh, that equation. Obviously, just like before, there's also a second solution, w2, which is minus w1, uh, because also here, if you square that minus sign, that will disappear in the squaring process and you just end up uh, back there. Now, it's interesting to figure out where exactly this minus sign comes from and looking at it in a slightly different way, this actually comes from the fact that the phase in this representation here, the argument, is only defined up to integer multiples of 2 pi. Because we can also write that z is rho exponential j theta plus 2 pi. And if we now use the same recipe to calculate the square root of a complex number, what we should do is we should take the real valued square root of the modulus and then we should half the argument. So we have exponential j theta over 2, but we also have an exponential j uh, pi, which is 2 pi over 2. And indeed, this exponential j pi, this is what gives us the minus 1. So fundamentally, the reason why we have a second solution over here is because the angle here is only defined up to an integer multiple of 2 pi. So if we just add 2 pi and blindly follow the rules, this second solution naturally rolls out of our calculations. Okay, but the important message here is that just like in the real valued case, in the complex valued case, the square root function is not single valued. So for a single z as an input, the output w f of z actually gives you two possible results. Here I've made a very simple diagram of the real valued square root. Can we also make something of the complex valued square root? That's a little bit more tricky, of course, because now we're dealing with four dimensional beasts. 
complex input, which is two variables, complex output, which is again two variables. Still, it's nice to look at pictures. So let's try and project that four dimensional thing down to three dimensions. So we can have a 3D plot where we have, for example, the X axis representing the real part of the input, the Y axis, the imaginary parts of the input Z. And then we have the Z axis. Well, let's say that this is, for example, the real part of, uh, of W. Just to have some echoes of the four dimensional nature of this thing, we can also bring color into the mix. And then we could say, for example, that if you look at the face of the output, that you associate that with a certain color. And that way you have a three dimensional object, which you can now also plot in a two dimensional plane of, of this screen. And then it looks something like, uh, like this, basically. So just to walk you through the axes here. So this is the horizontal axis X, and this is the vertical axis Y. So these two things are the real part, respectively the imaginary parts of the, uh, the input. And the, the point in the middle here, that's, that's the origin. So you clearly see that in this diagram, there's also contained the parabola of the square root for the real valued case, because for the real valued case, we should have the situation where y is uh, equal to zero, so where the imaginary part is, is equal to zero. So this is this parabola here, which is lying uh, over here. Okay, that, that's good. Um, another interesting, to, interesting thing to point out is that you clearly see that for a single input, so for a single point in the xy plane, there's actually two possible solutions for the square root. You have one solution, which is lying up here in this upper part of the diagram, and there's a second solution, which is lying down there in the lower parts of this, uh, this diagram. And you also see that this diagram intersects itself in a very interesting way. And by the way, that diagram is called the Riemann surface or a Riemann surface associated with the complex valued square root here. So a very interesting structure that clearly illustrates the multi-valuedness of that, uh, that square root. Just to get a better handling, uh, a better handle on how this thing intersects itself, let's do a simple experiment. Let's say we start at a certain point on that Riemann surface up here. And then what you should do is you should walk around on the Riemann surface and try and end up back at the same point where you start. And then keep track of how the angle, how the argument with respect to the, the origin here, how that thing changes if you walk around on the, the Riemann surface. So pause the video and go for a walk on the Riemann surface. So let's start our walk here. Um, then we start going down here until at a certain point we arrive here, which is just below our starting point. And if you carefully track what happens, for example, by looking in a top-down view, you can easily see that at this point you have circled once around the origin over here. So basically your phase has changed by 2 pi. But actually you're still only halfway through your walk because you haven't reached your original point here in the red zone yet. What you should do is you should continue here along the blue zone uh, and then cross over here in this region and then walk along the red slash purple zone until you arrive back at your starting point. So here you see that you need to make a second loop around the origin in order to get back to your starting point. So in essence, we have needed two revolutions around the origin or a phase change of four pi in order to get back to where we started from. But one thing you could say is that this Riemann surface is basically twice as large as the regular complex plane because your angle needs to change by four pi before you end up where you started. So this Riemann surface, very interesting topological structure, intersects itself um, in such a way that you need two round trips in order to get back to where you started from.